are leading to Rome, both politically and spiritually. We are living in the last days, and indeed, the days are evil. Welcome to part five of our series on Trojan horses. Trojan horses, subtitled Counterfeit Revivals, the Emergent Church, and the New Spirituality Movements. Our message today is entitled, Prayer Warriors, Prayer Walks, and Prayer Warfare. We are going to look at the new approach to spiritual warfare. You need to know that the Christian race is a spiritual warfare. It is a war over self itself. But this warfare of self is part of a bigger war between Christ and Satan, between truth and error, between God's people and the agents of the enemy. The only way Christians can remain victorious in this warfare is to maintain maximum diligence. Because the enemy has planted within our ranks some Trojan horses filled with deceptive teachings and practices. One of such practices is a new approach to spiritual warfare that is sweeping through Christian churches and missions, including our own. One indication of this growing popularity, of this warfare, is the growing popularity of such phrases as prayer warrior, prayer walk, anointing services, and many such things. You see, one effective way in any warfare by which an enemy can deceive the other is by stealing their language, then emptying their opponent's language of its original meaning, infusing it with a deceptive meaning so as to confuse the opponents. In the spiritual warfare going on, Satan has done similarly. He has hijacked the biblical teaching of spiritual warfare. And then he has loaded it with a brand new meaning. And unsuspecting individuals have no clue what is going on, and they are subtly sucked into this error. This is not the first time Satan has done that. He takes the biblical teaching of love, empties it, and adds a new twist to it. Faith has similarly been hijacked. The Sabbath has been hijacked, with a new false Sabbath, Sunday worship. Angels, the teaching about angels. I wish I could give another lecture about angels. You'll be amazed what has happened in there too. Yesterday, I talked about the new spirituality, which is nothing more than old-fashioned spiritualism, a return to ancient paganism, medieval and Eastern mysticism and occultic practices. But now it is called new spirituality. Christian meditation has become a yoga practice with mantra-like chants called breath prayer, centering prayer, or even Jesus prayer. But before we go into today's, where you are going to see another way Satan has hijacked the biblical teaching of spiritual warfare. Before we go into our study, permit me to do a little review of yesterday's. Since it is a class, it is a workshop, I enjoy giving you good reviews. And because this is also streamed via internet, for those who are just joining us, they will catch a little bit what we have been studying. Yesterday, I tried to show that any worldview that believes that there are no moral absolutes, that is, 
morality is relative or that there is no absolute truth, that is, doctrines and teachings are irrelevant, any movement, any organization, any worldview that teaches this essentially sets itself up for spiritualism's deception. And in our last presentation, I sought to demonstrate that postmodernist worldview has set up the foundation, the philosophical foundation for the pervasiveness of mystical New Age spirituality. This is pervasive in society as well as in the church. And I call your attention to how this is happening beginning in Roman Catholicism and then spreading to mainline Protestantism. Mainline Protestant simply means liberal Protestantism. And then it has moved into evangelical Protestantism. That is what we call conservative evangelicalism, where, by the way, we belong because we are a conservative church. And let no one fool you. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is a theologically conservative movement. We still believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He was born by a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He died for our salvation in what we call the atonement. He was buried. He bodily resurrected. He ascended to heaven. He is mediating as our high priest, and he will come again visibly, audibly, and all eyes would see him. We are a conservative church because we still believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Let no one fool you. This is a conservative church. But even within our ranks, spiritualism is making its inroads just as it is everywhere. I also mentioned to you that this return beginning with the Roman Catholic version of spiritual formation, which has affinities with the contemplative spirituality or mysticism found in other world religions, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and the rest, has laid the foundation for religious ecumenism not just ecumenism amongst churches, now it is a religious ecumenism. All religions are going to be united. The technical name for it is interspirituality. That's how they are calling it. And I mentioned to you Ellen White's statement that it is the Protestants in the United States who will first stretch forth their hands across the Gulf to embrace the hand of spiritualism. And then it will extend its hand to Rome. And when that happens, the foundation or the time will be near for the religious liberty being taken away. I also call your attention to Ellen White's statement in Great Controversy, page 558, where she says, while spiritualism formally denounced Christ and the Bible during modernistic time, the Bible was denounced, Christ was denounced. But now, in postmodernism, Ellen White says, but now it professes to accept both. It accepts Christ. It accepts the Bible. Ellen White continues, but the Bible is interpreted in a manner that is pleasing to the unrenewed heart. While its solemn and vital truths are made of no effect, Christ is verily denied as before. But Satan has so blinded the eyes of the people that the deception is not discerned. What was my point yesterday? Spiritualism is not just in the jungles of Africa, South America, or some South Pacific islands. Spiritualism is not just for black Africans. Today, spiritualism is also a Caucasian and an Asian American. Spiritualism now goes to church. Not just the Catholic church or Pentecostal charismatic church or even some Protestant church. Spiritualism is now coming to Adventist church. Dressed up, speaks Adventist language. 
and the language is very smooth. I alerted you. In fact, there wasn't time, and I'm glad there wasn't time, because I had enough information to convince skeptical audience that it is happening in our church. Perhaps a book will do it, then you can reference it, and no one will say you've taken them out of context. I have a whole folder, more than 50 pages, documenting what is happening in our own church, in our publications, at our conferences, in our schools, in our churches, the way we even worship. I should have called attention to sensual spirituality, spirituality with the senses, what you taste, what you feel, what you smell. Now the rooms are being darkened. It's almost like a discotheque. What people don't know is there is a reason behind it. Incense, candles, touch, and all of this. Perhaps that's another lecture. It is happening within the youth through youth specialties, which has been hijacked by the emergent uh, uh, thought leaders. Because they want to change the church. They would not leave the church. They tell them, don't leave your churches. Remain in your churches and change the churches from within. They tell you there will be resistance and opposition from the old folks. But don't worry about the old folks. They will die off. Concentrate on the young people. And so they are doing it. Because they know that many of the young people haven't been taught they lack foundation. The good news is God is also reviving young people. And they are coming back to the word of God. And they are standing, beginning to stand against this error that adults have been lulled into. Some may ask, but what is wrong with inviting emergent church leaders? I read their works, there's nothing wrong. I read their books, there's nothing wrong. Let me tell you what is wrong. When you invite such leaders to speak and teach in our schools, on our pulpits, you give them a platform to spread error. Even if they do not, in their presentations at that time, purvey error, because church members and students and young people are not warned. Let's say you invite someone to speak about poverty to speak about social issues. They do such a nice job that young people think, wow, this brother is good. And so they start reading their books and before you are aware, they are sucked in. And often that's how it is done. Those who are pushing this will not themselves proclaim it publicly, but they allow outsiders to do it for them. What is wrong with meditation, it will be asked, there is nothing wrong with meditation as long as it is understood that Christian meditation is not emptying one's mind of thought in order to be filled with uh, the divine. It is filling the mind by reflecting upon the words of God, not some mystical divine. What's wrong with spiritual disciplines and spiritual formation? Nothing wrong with that. Because there's nothing wrong with fasting, with praying, performing good service, with humility and the rest. The problem, however, is that often when these disciplines, spiritual formation and the rest, are taught in our schools, in our seminaries, and etc., they include the discipline of silence. And they will not tell you what that silence means. Thus, the term is used. But whenever you start probing what they are really saying, it actually talks about contemplative spirituality. What's the difference between the still small voice of Elijah? Elijah said he was still. Ladies and gentlemen, Elijah, when he was in a cave, First Kings chapter 19, he was not there to do contemplative spirituality. He was running away from Jezebel. And he did not initiate that so-called stillness. It was God who spoke to him by a still, small voice. If anyone was chanting some repetitious mantra-like words, it was the Baal worshippers on Mount Carmel, not Elijah. What am I saying? A whole lot is at stake. 
And the time has come for God's people to wake up to what is happening and dare to stand. There are a lot of resources I can call your attention to, and so I'll show you on the screen some resources you can, uh, because people were asking, where can I get some resources? Adventist Affirm, summer 2008, had a whole issue on emergent church. You can find it on the Adventist Affirm website. In fact, uh, all the articles are good. One particular article uh, you will find particularly insightful. It offers a devastating critique of one of the books I showed you yesterday on the screen, which has been published and is being promoted, and it's a required reading in some schools. Their website, www.adventistaffirm.org. If you want something about the Philosophical Foundation, these are books I found very valuable and I draw upon and I will recommend them highly. There is a book by Jean Edward Veit titled Postmodernism. It's an excellent book. It's a little philosophical, but it will tell you the foundations and how this happens. It's an English professor. And then there, is, there are two books that are very valuable. The book Faith Undone by Roger Oakland. They are not Adventists, but they are up to speed on what is happening. You may not agree with everything there, but it will open your eyes. Faith Undone by Roger Oakland. Another book is A Time of Departing by Ray Youngen. It will tell you how mysticism is uniting Christianity with world religions. These are all good resource materials, but there is one book I have found extremely valuable, and I will highly recommend it to you. Chances are you already have it. It's the book, The Great Controversy. It is the best work, The Great Controversy by Ellen G. White. It is the best work, particularly the last chapters, dealing with modern revivals, and the rest, you would find it particularly eye-opening. You might think she was writing right now. I have signs and wonders taking you through what is happening in Pentecostalism and Charismaticism. Then I have a series called Faithful Unto Death. It deals with ethics, one of the legs of holiness. Then I have cancer of the soul. It deals with spirituality, self, dying to self. And if you want to see how this is played out in the life of one Bible character, I have the return of Elijah. You'll find them helpful. As it was announced earlier also, the ABC has uh, some of my books here. Uh, and so these will be available at the back after today and perhaps even tomorrow, but I think it's today. Here we stand. I edited it. There are about 34 scholars and church leaders who contributed to it, and good articles about the new trends in the church. Receiving the Word is one of my earliest works, talking about what is happening to the Bible, and you've got to read it to understand the foundation. Must we be silent, deal with contemporary issues? And then my two latest books, Not for Sale, calling upon us to dare to stand, and then Healed Wounds, but Ugly Scars, that is the latest book that just came out a short while ago. So these are the resources uh, you may need. I also have additional material on my website, www.drpepem.org. I have a lot of articles dealing with contemporary issues. When you go there, you, you will find this beneficial. I've said enough, and now let's go to today's topic, which is prayer warriors, Prayer walks and prayer warfare, the new approach to spiritual warfare. I always begin, since our main theme is Trojan horse, I always look for analogies that are applicable for the day. In our opening message, I talk about the Greek mythology about the large hollow wooden figure horse which was filled by the Greek soldiers, uh, and it helped to, uh, to, to the destruction of the fortified city of Troy. In that first message, I said, beware, not everything that claims to be revival is revival. In the second message, I used the analogy of Trojan horse from computer, whereby 
a false program is introduced and then a hacker is able to manipulate your files and do whatever they want. The message, beware. Spirituality without ethics leads to antinomianism, mystical new age religion. In the third message, I use analogy from urban dictionary and the realm of morality. And I use the condom. Now sometimes we know some of these things, but we are not adept in understanding its full implications. I use the Trojan condom and how people poke holes through it to wreak havoc on their opponents, and it was designed to speak to the diminution of morality which postmodernism has done. The message, beware of any system that denies moral absolute and moral and, and absolute. Yesterday, I used the analogy from business for an advertising trick that baits you and then switches it and forces you to pay high prices. The message yesterday, beware. Not every form of spirituality and prayer that claims to be from God is from God. It could be spiritualism. Today, I'm going to use another analogy of a Trojan horse, but this time from the field of military, from warfare. In warfare, a Trojan horse is a clandestine subversive group working within to advance the goals of an enemy without. What do I mean? When there is a war, and then it is said that this person is a Trojan horse, what they mean is this group of individuals, though they are within, they are part of your group, they are actually secretly supporting the enemy, and they are engaging in espionage and sabotage activity. It is the enemy within who is taking his orders from without so that those of you within have no chance. It is similar to the fifth column. You've heard about the fifth column. It is a phrase attributed to the Spanish Civil War in 1936 and 39 and it is quoted to have been used by General Francisco Franco or one of his generals, uh, whose name is General Emilio Mola Vidal. He made a broadcast on October 16, 1936, that he was going to attack Madrid, the capital city, with four columns of soldiers. But then he said, we also have a fifth column inside. These are citizens in the city who are actually on our side. And so when you have a fifth column, they are actually masquerading. They are part of you, but their allegiance is somewhere else. Trojan horse. Trojan horse, in this sense, is equivalent to a fifth column. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a warfare going on in biblical Christianity. There is an enemy seeking to assault the city of God. But there is a fifth column inside. There is a Trojan horse inside. Individuals within who are allowing Satan's deceptive errors to prepare the way for the enemy to overcome us. Ellen White said in first selected messages, Book 1, page 122, we have far more to fear from within than from without. That is why this morning, in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about this new spiritual warfare. It is, there's a warfare, but in this warfare, there are Trojan horses. Don't believe anything that claims to be spiritual warfare, as we always do. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Father in heaven, as you've always done, open our minds to understand what is going on. Speak to us. If some of us have been mistaken unknowingly, may you get us back on track again. We ask in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Since the 1960s, a new approach to spiritual warfare has been sweeping through Christian churches. I say a new approach because Chris historically Christians have always believed that there is a war going on between Christ and Satan, between good and evil, between truth and error. Adventists call this the great controversy. And Christians have taught that in this war, the weapons we use, the weapons of our warfare are total surrender to the living Christ, an abiding faith in him, a devotional life of persevering prayer. Notice all these elements I'm mentioning have been hijacked. Faith, prayer, meditation on God's word, a wholehearted response of worship and witnessing, a loving obedience to all God's commandments, and a faithful adherence to the teachings of Scripture. That is how the Bible says we fight this war. However, in the new approach to spiritual warfare, we are being told that the Christian teaching on the subject is inadequate and that we need some extraordinary techniques to combat the enemy who is controlling our lives, our homes, our neighborhoods, our cities, and our countries. And the battle plan to fight this enemy it focuses on certain so-called powerful techniques. The weapons of our warfare in these cases require that you go for training sessions to prepare you as a mighty warrior to combat the forces of darkness. The new approach is called strategic level spiritual warfare. That's the technical name. It is for short spiritual warfare. But the technical name is strategic level spiritual warfare. The new way of fighting evil forces and the flurry of interest in the demonic have been fueled by four converging movements. The Pentecostal charismatic movement, the non-charismatic dispensational movement, the third wave signs and wonders where we have the laughing in the spirit and a host of them, and certain evangelical groups. And I would add now with the emergent church is now even a fifth column. During the past three or four decades, the teachings of these movements have spread to many denominations through church growth and missions classes that are taught in theological seminaries, through seminars and conferences on worship, on soul winning and church planting, and through a variety of tapes, cassettes, books, magazines, DVDs, songbooks, CDs, worship aids, religious TV and radio broadcasts, the Protestant keepers, and a host of others. Not surprisingly, our own Seventh-day Adventist scholars Pastors and members are uncritically embracing these theologies, these worship styles, church growth methods and missions and strategies from these movements. And invariably, we find ourselves adopting their method to defeat demons. It is important we understand this. This new approach to spiritual warfare, because at our last general conference session, we voted a 28th fundamental belief, which is to show how Jesus' victory gives us victory over the evil forces that seek to control us. That fundamental belief is a valid biblical one, but we must know the error. Otherwise, the Trojan horses would hijack it to push their agenda by claiming it is in our fundamental beliefs. That is why we need to spend some time on this. Satan has a counterfeit for everything. We already know that. Counterfeit miracles, counterfeit angels, counterfeit love, counterfeit unity, counterfeit doctrines, even counterfeit Sabbath or counterfeit Jesus. It shouldn't be surprising Therefore, that the enemy offers a counterfeit prayer as well. Such is the case. And today, there is a new enthusiasm for prayer that is sweeping many churches. 
Given the fascination with prayer, anyone who raises serious questions about prayer can be easily misunderstood. Who can possibly be opposed to prayer except they are on Satan's side? I'm saying this because I know somebody will say, some people is against prayer. But we must be careful here. For the enemy of our souls is very cunning. He has the Trojan horses, his fifth columns of errors designed to deceive. To understand how prayer is gaining new popularity in the churches and how it plays a major role in this deceptive approach to spiritual warfare, I'll give you some few ideas about developments. The first one, it's an error, is prayer is a spiritual gift. On the agenda of many churches today, you are hearing prayer ministries, prayer departments, prayer coordinators. These are popping up everywhere to coordinate prayer offensives against Satan and his forces. These may sound like very positive developments in that they seem to evidence spiritual growth in the lives of members and perhaps a sign of revival. But are they? Lest I should be misunderstood, let me make it very clearly that there is nothing wrong with praying. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. Jesus himself taught men uh, that we ought to pray and not faint. Luke 18 verse 1. And yet it seems to me that something insidious is happening in this new approach to prayer. What is supposed to be the responsibility of all believers is now slowly becoming the specialty of few. Observe that prayer is never listed as a spiritual gift. It isn't. Prayer is not a spiritual gift, for if it were, then it is only for a few individuals. Prayer is for all of us. And so there is no such thing as the gift of prayer. What am I saying? The gift of prayer, which is in the possession of a few individuals who are deemed to be effective than all in their prayers. Intercessory prayer is slowly becoming the exclusive domain of a few spiritual gurus or prayer warriors. These prayer coordinators constitute the new priesthood to whom we must all look in order to know how to offer effective prayers. Believe me, I know we have prayer warriors, prayer coordinators, godly people. I am simply saying we use these terms, but perhaps we don't know where it is coming from. So if I use this, this is no personal attack on anyone. I'm simply helping you understand how Satan has hijacked our language. Are we together? The sad irony is, now that we have these prayer warriors, the people with the gift of prayer, it has the tendency to make not everyone pray because they look up to those few individuals to do the praying for them. Even more, the illusion that we are really praying, some of our prayer ministries and prayer coordinators are chasing after and promoting the latest prayer fads and formulas, which they think really work. These fads include prayer warriors, Prayer offensive, prayer walks, Jericho marches, you know, where people go around a location, march around like the walls of Jericho. Jericho marches, prayer anointing services, and of course the famous one, the prayer of Jabez. Yesterday I mentioned contemplative prayer, breath prayer, centering prayer, Jesus prayer. The point is everyone into it. And in many cases, we blindly follow without knowing what we are doing. One evidence, one mistaken error, prayer is a gift, spiritual gift. It isn't. The second error, prayer is seen as a set formula, which must be uttered in a particular way, with a particular frequency. You must pray that prayer X number of times if you are to have peace of mind or to able to accomplish what you are doing. And the book Prayer of Jabez, 
is one classic example of this new, I call it Christian mantra or talismanic formula of repetitious prayer. Not too long ago, prayer of Jabez became like a plague in our churches. Mega selling book, just 92 pages, it sold millions. And with that, when prayer of Jabez was at its peak, we have prayer of Jabez Bibles, prayer of Jabez desk calendars, prayer of Jabez uh, uh, Christian enterprises, prayer of Jabez prayer meetings, Jabez, I mean, everything is into prayer of Jabez, from sermons to workshops to evangelism. And many of us just followed along. Because Jabez was in town. Perhaps an American. Perhaps one reason we were so sucked into it is when you read that book, it looks very good. In fact, I would dare say 99.5% of the book is good. But here is the danger. When you have whole 100% whole nutritious meal and less it with rat poison, it becomes more deadly. You don't have to be a space scientist with insight from the spirit of prophecy to know that that prayer is fraught with error. The author promotes rote, repetitious prayer. Right in the preface, he says, I want to teach you how to pray a daring prayer that God will always answer. God always answers a particular prayer. In brief, it is only one sentence with four parts, tucked away in the Bible. But I believe it contains the key to a life of extraordinary favor with God. This petition has radically changed what I expect from God, what I expect every day from Him. In fact, thousands of believers who are applying these truths are seeing miracles happen on a regular basis. Notice the key that will make God always answer your daring prayer is this famous prayer of Jabez. And when you offer it, you are guaranteed. In fact, on pages 11 and 24, he says, I guarantee you. All you need to do is to repeat the prayer every day for 30 days. And then, as he concludes the book, he says, quote, I challenge you to make the prayer of Jabez, to make Jabez prayer for blessing part of the daily fabric of your life. To do that, I encourage you to follow unwaveringly the plan outlined here for the next 30 days. By the end of that time, you'll be noticing significant changes in your life on and on and on. That's according to this book. In order to pray a prayer God would always answer, you must follow that formula given in this particular case. is prayer of Jabez. The centering prayer are now using different versions. You repeat it so many times and on and on. What you don't know is it is no different from the mantra from Hindu mystical religions where you have to repeat a particular prayer X number of times. As a matter of fact, while some of us didn't catch it, the Roman Catholic magazine, our Sunday visitor, made a commentary about this prayer of Jabez and said, listen, this thing they are calling prayer of Jabez and the practice is no different from what we Catholics do, repeating the rosary. In fact, I, I have the reference and I can give you uh, later on. But then he added, this is taking us way off to the gospel of uh, wealth and power. So they themselves, the Catholics said, this repetitious prayer is going to Rome but we don't see it. Jesus warned us against vain, repetitious prayer, Matthew 6, 5 to 13. I'm talking about prayer as a spiritual gift, prayer as a formula, and another error is warfare prayer. This is where I'll be spending the remainder of my time. Warfare prayer is the ultimate conclusion of all of these new mindset to prayer. This is where they believe that certain techniques employed in prayer can help you combat territorial demons who are believed to hover over or inhabit specific territorial locations, whether your car, your church, your pews, your microphones, and the rest. The objective, the, the proponents tell us, is to enable you get rid of Satan either in your life or in your church, or in your habitat, and make evangelism very effective. Who can pray in this prayer? The prayer warrior called generals of intercession. They are supposed to be the people who have the knowledge. 
Yes, they may share it with you, but it is so dangerous that not everyone can engage in it. So only the prayer warriors can do it. They have received the training. Where can they pray? They have to pray on site, on particular locations, where the evil forces are believed to be inhabiting. So prayer warriors must embark on prayer offensives to bind and break the strong walls of demons. Where should they do this? Well, if the demons are believed to be inhabiting your house or your community, we call it prayer walk. You have to go walk around the house or community. If the demons are believed to inhabit a city, they call it praise marches or Jericho marches. Then there is prayer expeditions for entire regions and prayer journeys for entire nations. So loads of Christians will fly themselves to a particular location and pray. So where do you pray? Pray a particular prayer on site. How do you pray? You have to pray using some specific formulas. One example of such a prayer is, I quote, on the basis of our submission to God, we in faith resist the devil and his work. We resist all forces and powers of evil that have taken hold of, let's say, Cedar Lake, Michigan. We resist the spirit of wickedness that has been established in the strongholds of, let's say, Great Lakes Academy. The dark work of the enemy, the mystery places where the enemy has set his encampment, we call upon the name of the Lord to destroy the strongholds. We proclaim this day that this city is now under the captivity and ownership of the Holy Spirit. All other spirits we banish, we ban, we rebuke, we, I mean, they do all kinds of things. Another prayer. Which basically says, we trample down the demon of pride, the demon of anger, the demon of lust, the demons of X, Y, Z. Even there are ancestral demons which are passed on through one's blood. And so there's a prayer for that one. I cancel out all demonic working that has been passed on to me from my ancestors. As one who has been crucified with Jesus and raised to walk in newness of life, I cancel every curse that may have been put upon me. Notice the prayer. I resist. I pull down. I smash. I break. I destroy. It is I, 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 I. Who are we praying for? And when even you listen carefully, the name of Satan appears even more than Jesus. So who are you praying to? And there's more I can say about this. You see, where did this come from? Now let me go to the foundation. The strategic level spiritual warfare. If you listen closely, it is no different from animistic pagan religion. It comes from two major foundations. There is a theory of demons, and then there is also the practice of exorcising the demons. What is the doctrine? The doctrine simply says that there are specific demons who control different localities. So, for example, in geographical areas, such, let's say, Middle East or Native American uh, reservations or whatever, there are demons in control over those areas. There are ethnic demons. So there are demons which possess black people and Caucasians and Asians. There are geopolitical demons. So demons controlling nations, political parties, and governments. There are topographical demons. Demons in charge of valleys, rivers, and mountains. Ecological demons in charge of the trees, dreams, rocks, and the rest. Occupational demons in charge of every occupation. Domestic demons, those in charge of your marriage and your home and everything. They believe that demons are in charge of different locales. And this belief has led them to construct how to overcome in those areas. A belief in these demons suggests that when you are approaching a black person, you must find a way to cast out the demons of black people. When you are going to uh, evangelize in a particular area, you must do something by going with your prayer journey, prayer work to exorcise the demons. Even demons in charge of your pews. If you are going to conduct evangelism, evangelistic campaign, because there are demons in charge of the pews or the microphone, you have to perform some prayer to exorcise them. 
And how do you do the exorcism? That's the theory. It's a theory of demons. Then how do we do the practice? It begins by rebuking and binding the demons which are believed to have control or indwell the Christians and render them ineffective in receiving the blessings of God. This is the justification for deliverance ministry. Then there are also, they have to believe that you have to cast out demons in unbelievers who have been taken captive so that you can deliver them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. This has given birth to the prayer offensive, prayer warrior, and prayer walk. And then you have to pray so that the gospel can be well received when you cast out, the, uh, rebuke, and curse the demons. This has given rise to anointing people, anointing places. Now you go to some places, some bizarre things are happening when you have these prayer warriors all dressed up in white. They come holding vials of oil, try to anoint everything. What people don't know is where it is coming from. And how, what are the steps for this warfare? You must first seek the name of the ruling spirit in that area. Well, how do you know the name? Well, the demon will tell you. When did Satan tell the truth? If you don't know the name, use their functional name, such as the demon of lying, the demon of anger, the demon of poverty. Then number two, you must identify the territory of the demons. Because you need to know which demon operates where. And then you map out their boundaries. It's almost like have a zip code for the various demons. It is called spiritual mapping. And then once you have mapped it out, then send the prayer warriors, the generals, on an offensive to attack, directly confront and engage these demons. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a biblical teaching. I come from Africa. It is traditional pagan animistic practice. But now these guys in the name of Jesus. And they use a number of Bible texts to justify it. Let me call attention to some of these Bible texts. You see, the Bible teaches that as a result of the fall of Adam and Eve, Satan is now the God and ruler of this world. The proponents of this kind of prayer go beyond this teaching when they start assigning demons to each particular region and locality, places they believe they reside and are restricted to. Where did they get this from? A couple of texts which you need to know how it has been twisted. Mark chapter 5 verse 9, where Jesus met the demons of Gadara and then Jesus asked, what is thy name? And the demon a possessed person said, my name is Legion, for we are many. Proponents use this text to suggest that the demons have a name. And therefore, we should know the names of the demon, because Jesus said, what is thy name? And so the names of such demons are demons of self-destruction, demons of anger, demons of hate, demons of fear, demons of whatever. Notice, however, that this text does not teach that you must go and name demons. Jesus did not initiate a conversation with demons. Instead, he was responding to the demons after they had taken, uh, uh, the, after they had taken the initiative. Even when this happened, Jesus did not ask them to identify themselves. He only did so after he had cast out the demons. Also, Christ didn't enter into dialogue with demons, nor did he connect demons to patterns of sin in the demonia. Jesus never received the name for an answer. When he was asked, what is thy name? He got a number, not a name. The demon said, we are legion. And although he never got a name, the demons obeyed Christ. Anyway, there's more I can say. I don't want to go into the wrong text. Uh, another text that is often used is Mark chapter 5, verse 10. When the demon, the demon said, demoniacs, don't send us out of this area. You know, and Jesus sent them into pigs. Don't send us out of this area. The warfare 
theologians will tell you the demons have been assigned a particular region and if they left their region, Satan would punish them. So they didn't want to leave that region. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not what the Bible teaches. The demons were not afraid of deportation, but of torment in an abyss. You can read it, Luke 8:31. They feared that Jesus, not Satan, had come to punish them. It isn't some Satan who punished them. Another text that is used is Acts 19, 28 and 35, where we are told the Ephesians shouted, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. On the basis of this text, the proponents conclude Artemis was the territorial spirit in charge of the city of Ephesus. On the contrary, the Bible simply teaches Artemis is not just associated with Ephesus. Artemis was an amalgamation of the various distinct deities. The mother goddess of Asia Minor, the Greek goddess of Artemis, and the Roman goddess of Diana. In fact, the Bible itself explains what they meant when they said, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. If you read verse 35, they explain, Men of Ephesus... Doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image and fell from the heaven? In other words, the goddess was not the guardian of the city, but rather the city was the guardian of that god. They also use Revelation chapter 2 verse 13, which talks about Pergamum, the place where Satan resides. On this, they will say, Satan has a geographical area where he resides. Now, if that is true, aren't we to be grateful that Satan is only in Pergamos and not in the United States? Notice, the Bible doesn't teach that. Until Jesus comes, Satan will prowl all over the face of the globe, not just in Pergamos. Moreover, the book of Revelation makes similar com comments about Satan being in Smyrna, in Theathera, in Philadelphia, in uh, all these places. In fact, in each place it says the synagogue of Satan was in Smyrna or wherever. In Theathera, the Bible says where Satan's secrets are taught, and on and on. If the logic of spiritual warfare is true, if Satan resides in Pergamos, but works in Smyrna, Theathera, and Philadelphia, then it means Satan does a lot of commuting to work. Besides, if he is ruler of Pergamon, what is he doing by interfering in other cities? The point is, the so-called teaching of this spiritual warfare is so ridiculous and it is mindless, senseless, and lacks biblical support, but it is twisted. Let me answer a few questions as I get towards the next few uh, minutes. What I'm saying is the doctrine lacks biblical support. Number two, the doctrine uh, should Christians engage in warfare prayer. The Bible doesn't teach that. But warfare theologians will tell you uh, Daniel engaged in warfare prayer. Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, where Daniel was praying, and the Bible says, The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, and Michael, one of the chief princes, came to my help, on and on and on. Notice, Daniel never seeks the names of demons or the angels, nor does he ever engage them in prayer. The only name he receives are those of Gabriel and Michael, the heavenly uh, beings. The evil powers are known only by the generic title, Prince of Persia and Prince of Greece. And Daniel himself was praying and he was not even aware of what was going on. How could he be engaged in prayer warfare when he didn't even know what was going on between the combatants? There's more I can say. They also base it on Zechariah chapter 3 verses 1 and 2 where Joshua the high priest was standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan was there and then the angel of the Lord said, Satan to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord rebuke you. They use it to say, we can rebuke demons. Once again, notice, the only human participant is Zechariah. He is a bystander. 
It is the angel of the Lord, which, by the way, Ellen White explains is Christ himself who did the rebuking. You don't have any power to... Anyway, uh, Jude chapter 9 is another one where Moses, you know, after his death, there was a battle over him, and the Lord rebuked Satan. The point is, we are not to rebuke these demons. At least, the text they use do not justify it. Should we bind demons... Once again, there are all kinds of things. I don't have time to go into it. The bottom line is the Bible does not teach us that. They mistakenly appeal to Matthew 12, 29, and the rest, where a gentleman, is a parable Jesus told, in which a man entered a house that belonged to a strong man, tied him up, robbed him of his possession. It's actually a parable about Christ and Satan. Satan has taken our house in captive. All of us are his captive. Jesus, the strong man, comes in there, binds the enemy, defeats him through Calvary, the resurrection, ascension, and, and sets us free. That is what it is talking about. It has nothing to do with this. There's more. Should we engage in this preemptive attack on the strongholds of Satan? I'm bringing this to a close within the next 10 minutes. This is very important. Should Christians embark upon preemptive war to attack Satan? Should we go on prayer offensives? Advocates use it, base it on Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10 onwards, which talks about, you know, our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, on and on and on. Now, this passage is not telling us we should go and declare war on Satan in an offensive or combative fight. In fact, before we look at Ephesians chapter 6, we must mention why Christians are not to launch their own preemptive strike against Satan. In the first place, it was Satan who declared the war. Revelation chapter 12, he declared a war. So it is not Christians who are declaring war on Satan. We don't have any business declaring war on him. The war was going on before we were even born. And it was initiated by Satan. Secondly, God had already won the war. And that is good news. Though God had won the war, the enemy has been given a short time. And during this short time before he's finally destroyed, he is angry. And we cannot engage Satan except through the power of Christ. So you have no business going to initiate and attack a wounded lion. It is important to highlight the victory Christians have in this warfare with the enemy. While the book of Ephesians teaches that there is a war going on, Ephesians chapter 6, and that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places, Ephesians 6 verse 12, Paul makes certain facts clear in the book of Ephesians. Before he said it in chapter 6, in, from chapters 1 onwards, he had made a compelling case. Let me summarize for you. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul declares that Jesus Christ has defeated Satan through his death, resurrection, and exaltation at the right hand of the Father. Satan has been conquered. So it isn't you who are going to fight Satan. You can read from verses 19 to 23. The exceeding greatness of his power to us what who believe according to the working of the mighty power which he wrought through Christ and he states all of this. Jesus has won the war already. That's Ephesians chapter 1. Because Jesus has won the war our role is not to go and initiate any other war. In fact the terms used in Ephesians 1, 19 to 23, I didn't have time to read it. All power, it uses dunamis, energia, kratos, ixtus, belong not to the spirits or to the mediums, but to Christ. So Christ has all power under him. That's why Romans chapter 8, 37, 39. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him 
who loved us. And Paul says, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor anything present, nor height, nor depth, can able to separate us from the love of Christ, which is in Christ Jesus. What Paul is teaching is, Christ has all power, not only over celestial powers, but over all dominions. The victory has been won already. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us every conversion of a Christian demonstrates that Satan's power is being broken. Up to this time, though all of us were still in the clutches of Satan. But Ephesians 2 tells us Jesus Christ, any time someone is converted, another victory has been wrought by wrestling that person from the grapes of Satan. Victory has been won. Ephesians chapter 3 will tell us the existence of the Christian church indicates the victory is ours. Up until that time, God's people were located on a small marginal location in Palestine, the people of Israel. And Satan thought the whole world was his. But today, Ephesians 3 will tell us, the church is everywhere, in every nation, kindred, multitude, and tongue. And so the very existence of the Christian church indicates that Satan's power has been broken. Having said all of this, and I'm skipping so many things, only then did Ephesians 6 say, we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers. How did he come there? Paul was arguing, though Satan is defeated for, he is still dangerous. Until he is totally destroyed, he is set and offering a counter-attack. Let me say it differently. Satan has been defeated, but he wants to wage a counter-attack so that he will redeem the captives that Jesus has wrestled from his hand. We are the people redeemed. What is our responsibility in this warfare in which Satan is waging a counter of it? Our responsibility, and herein lies spiritual warfare. I'm about to conclude. Our responsibility is to resist the devil not to declare war on him. We are to resist him with the promise that he will flee from us, James 4, 7. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. Herein lies the nature of our warfare, resistance, that is defense, not attack, offense. We, our warfare is one of resistance, holding the line. We are not called to go and declare or even wage war on the enemy. In fact, how do we fight the enemy? Contrary to what advocates tell us, the Bible teaches that the Christian's role in the ongoing battle is to stand firm in the face of Satan's counter-attack. Our role, again, is not offensive, but what? defensive. We are to stand fast. We are to stand firm. Now, look at the following verses. Ephesians 6 verse 11. Notice how often the word stand is used. Verse 11, Ephesians 6. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to do what? Stand against the walls of the devil. Look at verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to do what? We stand in the evil day, and having done all to do what? Stand. Look at verse 14. Stand, therefore, having your loins get about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. The idea of standing is a military metaphor. It, it portrays a soldier who has been threatened by an enemy, and he's engaged in close combat. Under the fierce assault of the enemy, the commander does not ask the soldier to go and wage another war or launch another attack somewhere. The commander says, hold the line. 
Stand firm. Resist it so that you hold on to the ground that has already been taken. Ladies and gentlemen, standing firm means hold the ground already taken by Christ in the face of Satan's counter-offensive. So repeatedly, now you can go to the Bible and look at the word stand. You'll be amazed. In 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 8, the Thessalonians are to stand firm in the midst of persecution. 2 Thessalonians 2 15, they were to stand in the face of false teaching. Philippians 1.27, the Philippians were to stand in the midst of persecution and not be cowered by fear of their opponents. Colossians chapter 4 verse 12, they were to stand in all the will of God lest they be swayed by heresy and seduced by sin. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 16, 13 and 14, they were to stand in the faith in doing all things with charity. The idea of standing, ladies and gentlemen, is hold the line. Satan would attack you with illness. He would bring in false doctrines. He would accuse you. He would do everything but hold the line. That is the warfare we are to engage in. What are the weapons of our warfare? Is it some, uh, some binding the demons, some techniques? Of, well, no, the Bible says the weapons of our warfare, verse 10 to 17, the breastplate of the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the shield of faith. That is the weapons we use. And Satan is counterfeiting all this. What kind of prayer are we to offer? Are we to go bind, do whatever? No. Verses 18 to 20 will tell us, praying with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, watching thereunto with perseverance. And he goes on. It talks about diligence. It talks about Praying at all times, it talks about, there are all kinds of things I can say. Where is the site of our prayer? Are we supposed to go to some place, some house, and I say, I cast out the demon in this house, I give you permission? Is that what the Bible teaches? No, the Bible doesn't teach a site for prayer where we must go on prayer walks, prayer smashes, prayer journey, prayer expeditions. On, on, the, on the contrary, Paul asks the Ephesians to pray for all the saints and for me. Paul was not in Ephesus, but he asked the Ephesians to pray for him. If they had to go to where Paul was as a site of prayer, it nullifies what Paul is saying. And the Bible tells us Paul regularly prayed for the churches. He didn't have to go there on site. You don't have to go to your hometown to pray for someone over there in order for God to hear you. Your God is not a pagan God who is limited to some valleys or some whatever. Our God is a sovereign God. So this notion, brother, sister, let me set you aside and have to pray for you, you better think about it again. There is a place for us meeting together to pray, going to someone and praying with him. But the notion that you have to go to some site in order to pray for God to hear you is a misguided and magical doctrine. What am I saying? If ever there was a time to pray, it is now. But the new approach to prayer, as taught by the spiritual warfare movement, is a deceptive ploy by the enemy to confuse and lead God's people to destruction. It is a Trojan horse. A fifth column designed to deceive God's people. When Christ was giving his last message to the churches, the inactive church of Laodicea, which is a symbol of the end time church, even our church, Christ did not ask the pastors of Laodicea or the scholars and church members to go and attend a seminar or some training session on how to pray to defeat the demon of lukewarmness. When he wanted to see a revival in the church, he didn't ask a few prayer warriors or prayer coordinators or prayer generals to do so. When he wanted his church to be successful in missions in unentered territories, he didn't engage in prayer offensive, prayer works, and commanding and rebuking the demons. None was encouraged to rebuke the demon of hypocrisy, the demon of materialism, and the rest. There were no anointing services 
to anoint pills, members, the people's forehead and the rest, and some of these bizarre, ridiculous things being pushed from certain quarters of our church. Instead, Christ simply told that lukewarm church in Laodicea, repent. Repent. That is the beginning of deliverance. And that is our need today. You see, the real warfare, ladies and gentlemen, is not your mother or your father or your wallet or whatever. The real warfare is a warfare over self. Whether we will surrender to the Lordship of Christ in what he says or in what we think, that is the greatest battle. So let me conclude by reading this text to you. It's a statement from Ellen White, The Real Spiritual Warfare. This is from Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 141. The Christian life is a battle and a match, but the victory to be gained is not won by human power. The field of conflict is the domain of the heart. That is the side. The field is the heart. The battle which we have to fight, the greatest battle that was ever fought by man, is what? The surrender of self to the will of God. She goes on to say, the yielding of the heart to the sovereignty of love. The old nature, born of blood and of the will of the flesh, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The hereditary tendencies, the former habits must be given up, and this begins with repentance. Ladies and gentlemen, don't be taken by this warfare prayer. It is pagan practice. And here we see what is happening. Modern Christianity has gone all the way back to paganism. Yesterday, it has gone back to Eastern mystical religions, all of them uniting with Rome for this new ecumenical movement. It is at this time that God's people must stand in the truth and let the Lord give them victory. Is that your wish? Is that your prayer? I'm sure there are some of you who have been involved in some of these things you had no clue. The Lord knows during the time of ignorance, he overlooks, and many of us have been ignorant in many things, we have been honestly mistaken. But when truth is presented to an honestly mistaken person, they cease either to be mistaken or they cease to be honest. Let me say it one more time. When truth is presented to an honestly mistaken person, they cease to be mistaken. If they love the truth and they embrace the truth, they cease to be mistaken. But if they have no respect for truth, they cease to be honest. My prayer is today, by the grace of God, we'll say, Lord, help me. Is that your wish? Why not stand for prayer? Our Father in heaven, thank you for what you have taught us today. We are beginning to see that indeed the days in which we live are evil. Help us to be vigilant. May we put on the whole armor of God and resist the devil to stand firm, to hold the line, no matter what the enemy will throw at us. Make this our experience, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have been blessed by this media, you may want to consider a donation to help support our efforts to spread these important and timely messages. For this and other great witnessing material, please visit our media center at www.hopevideo.com. You can also email us at hope at hopevideo.com. Our media includes DVD, video, CD audio, and cassette. You can also listen to much of our media for free at our online media center at www.hopevideo.com. That's hopevideo.com.